Great. All right, so thanks for joining us today for Faster Failover Starts with a Faster Cloud. Just a couple of quick housekeeping announcements before we dive in. First, I'm always asked if there are a copy of these slides. So I just want to let you know off the bat, yes, you can grab a copy of the slides. They're available in the handout section of the software. And then also, there is going to be a replay video available to you. So I'm also frequently asked if there's a, a recording of the webinar. And so that will be available within about 24 hours. I'll post that up on infrascale.com slash webinars. So you'll also be able to get access to that. Lastly, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just use the question tool within the software. And we are going to have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, but please do feel free to go ahead and use that question tool throughout the presentation. Anytime something comes up that you have a question about, um, go ahead and use that there. All right. And my name is Carla Fedrigo. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Infrascale. I'll be presenting today. And then let's take a look at the agenda. So first we are going to cover threats to business continuity. And then we'll talk about how the cloud is changing uh, disaster recovery. We'll discuss Infrascale and the Google Cloud, that partnership that I just mentioned. And then we'll finish with the Q&A and open discussion for any uh, questions or comments. All right, so diving right in. First, if we think about threats to uptime in, in any company, we generally are thinking about one of these three things. And so these are three themes that I'm going to come back to several times throughout the presentation. One is the loss of data. And secondly is, is data hijacking, right, Where, or ransomware that we keep hearing about more and more. Third is uh, business downtime just by losing data, having systems and servers go down, any type of natural disaster or any other type of downtime. So those are really the three themes and those threats to uptime that we're going to talk about um, quite a bit today. And taking a look first at data loss. So the problem of data loss is, is really as old as computers have been in use. And as long as we've had these machines, we have questions of what happens when they go down. And even to this day, we still have lots of people, lots of companies that lose data. And um, some recent statistics, really, the, that you see here on your screen, this, this could be from anything from maybe leaving a phone in a taxi or for getting a laptop on a plane. So those sort of micro disasters, all the way up to macro disasters, hardware failure, uh, natural disasters, those tornadoes, fires, floods, um, server crashes, or even human error as well. So regardless of whatever the cause may be, without the assurance that your data is there, it's really going to hurt a business. And these are just some of the stats that I want to share with you. Lost apps, 75% of companies in this survey lost software applications. 25% uh, of PC user, users lose data every single year, and 15% of all laptops are stolen or suffer hard drive failures. So taking a look at a little bit more data here, and moving on to the ransomware theme, right? This is a very particular kind of data loss, more like data hijacking, because when ransomware happens, you no longer have access to your data since the hacker has introduced malware to the user's computer and encrypted all that data. And then suddenly they release a warning screen or a, a pop-up on your machine stating that the user needs to pay a certain cost in Bitcoin in order to retrieve their data. So this is really that the second issue or the second theme. And it can really trip up business continuity. These are some of the specific stats to ransomware. And what we are finding is that millions and millions of dollars are being paid in ransomware each year. And this is really growing exponentially. So we're looking at um, 2000, 2000
900 new malware modifications, and that was uh, the first quarter of 2016. But by Q3 of 2016, that was up to 30,000. So that's really showing you the exponential growth of ransomware. And then, uh, again, in the first three quarters of last year, over $200 million was paid in ransom. That's expected to be $1 billion in 2017. So now let's take a look at the third theme, downtime. And of course, downtime is really when all of your systems go down. This could be caused by uh, system outages, by, by micro disasters like hardware that fails or a disk drive that crashes or a software virus that brings down a computer. It could even be one of those uh, things like a human issue, someone that accidentally deletes data or maybe angrily deletes data a uh, former employee or uh, those types of issues. And then there are also the environmental issues, power outages, brownouts. Um, that, those happen on a relatively frequent basis to account for downtime. And then there are also those macro disasters. They only happen once in a while. Uh, the tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, floods, really regardless of the type of downtime, large or small, you want to be able to have a system in place. And looking at some of the stats here, we see the percentages of the, the root causes of downtime. So 55% of all downtime is caused by hardware failure, and then 22% by human error. So these two causes combined account for about three quarters of all downtime, probably not surprising. And then software failure accounts for 18%, and natural disasters less than 5%. Now, of course, you hope that it never happens to you. Everyone always thinks, it's never going to happen to me, that'll happen to someone else. But if you look at these stats on the left here, the pervasiveness of downtime, looking, looking at these numbers, among your client base collectively, these stats show that you will have someone experience an issue this year. Now, if that does occur, what are the costs of downtime? Well, we've taking a look at these stats here, we see the cost can be significant. And that cost scales with the size of the business. It can cost several thousands of dollars for smaller businesses and up to hundreds of thousands of dollars for large organizations. And now these are just the averages of the cost per hour of downtime. The average for a small company was 8,000 and then the average for a large enterprise was $600,000. So this is really something that you need to ask yourself, uh, is, is are you willing to risk this? Most businesses, especially if they're on the small or medium size, uh, would go out of business being down for 24 hours. They simply cannot risk that happening. So now that we've introduced some of the causes of downtime, I want to shift and talk about what we can actually do about them. And I do have a quick poll for you. So let me go ahead first and launch this quick poll. So you've heard a little bit from me, and now I'd like to hear a little bit from you. So are you using the cloud for more than 50% of your business applications? A, yes, B, no, and C, I'm not sure. So I'll give everyone a moment to answer that. So far, we've got about 50% of you have voted. I'll give everyone another minute. Great, 80% have voted so far. I'll just give everyone one more moment and then I'll go ahead and share the results. All right, so thank you everyone for those of you who participated. Let me go ahead and close this poll down and share the results. We've got 17% saying yes, 83% saying no, and then nobody actually answered not sure. So that's wonderful to hear. Everyone's aware of what's going on with their business. 
And let me go ahead and close this poll down here so that we can dive back to the presentation. All right, great. So I got that screen share back up now. Just use the question tool Let me, in case you cannot uh, see that, that screen again. We're back to the cloud solutions for data loss and downtime. So again, now that we've introduced the causes of downtime, we're going to shift and, and talk about what we can do about them, right? And sticking with these, those three themes of data loss, ransomware and downtime, we know now what those causes are and some of the trends and, and stats associated with those themes, but let's look at how to actually eradicate downtime, what we can do in order to do that. So when it comes to data loss, we're going to look at backup and recovery. And for ransomware, we're going to introduce anomaly detection. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then when it comes to downtime, we're going to discuss DRAS, or Disaster Recovery as a Service. So again, starting with the data loss problem, and let's talk about backup and recovery first. We essentially know that we should be backing up our data, right? We have um, data centers that are core to the business, we have mission critical headquarters, even remote branch offices. We maybe have local servers in a branch office, and then we have applications that the business cannot run without, and we have users, um, their laptops, mobile devices, and the data on those devices. So organizations generally have a priority on the value of their data, right? And even though we know we should be doing this. Normally mobile devices in remote branch offices aren't protected, or maybe they're not sufficiently protected. So that this still remains an issue. And what you really want is a cloud-based backup solution. The reason behind that is there are a lot of users and a lot of endpoints that are mobile. There are employees that are remote, or maybe they're working from home. You don't necessarily have a dedicated software-based solutions that, that can depend on corporate networks. So something that's installed on these users' computing device and that's connected to the internet and backs up data directly to the cloud is what you need. And that really lets the end user be mobile, they can work remotely or while they're traveling, really from anywhere that they need to. So it doesn't depend on a corporate network, it keeps everything secure and in a central location so that they can recover whatever they need at any time that they might need it. Then looking at ransomware mitigation, that's the second theme that we're looking at. Several factors in defense against data hijacking here. First is to train end users, so end user education. As much as we all know that in a, in a perfect world, nobody's gonna click on a malicious link or nobody's gonna open one of those phishing emails, but of course, if that were the case, ransomware wouldn't even be an issue and we wouldn't really be talking about it on this webinar right now. So as much as we all want to be really responsible users, people get tricked and this happens on a daily basis. So you wanna train your end users to know first off how to recognize phishing attacks and suspicious links or email attachments. But then also, secondly, admins need to test their knowledge with simulated phishing attacks and ensure that they've been properly conditioned to resist these attacks. So that's the first bit is that education, right? And then you also need to use an industry-leading antivirus solution, an anti-malware solution. You wanna to try to catch this before it even takes root in your systems. So you wanna use an industry-leading antivirus software and also enable the auto-updates, the auto-protect, and the personal firewall features on it. So you always want to have that protection in the background that's going to be continually up to date. And then third is to uh, maintain a robust backup and disaster recovery solution. That's your third line of defense is have a really good backup of that data. And in general, any backup system will do, right? So long as it's going to back up your data and systems, 
it's going to allow you to roll back to a date before the ransomware hit, and then it's going to let you recover without having to pay the ransom. But on top of that, here at InfraScale, we're going beyond just traditional backup, and we have introduced something called anomaly detection. So here is a look at that anomaly detection feature. Now, what it does and how it works um, is that we're monitoring the backup activity and we're looking at the patterns of data change. More specifically, we're looking at how frequently that data is changing, right? So in this change rate analysis, we're monitoring the normal number of changed files per day. And then, as you see on the right in this screenshot here, if we suddenly see a spike, where there's a much larger number of files that have been changed, then an alert's released. So we can proactively see the threat of data encryption by hackers before the ransom's even posted. And what we're doing is we send an alert out to the admins or service providers, and that way you can detect it before the threat hits. So you can roll back to a clean data environment faster and obviously far less data loss involved there, and you don't, have to, you don't have to pay any of those ridiculously high ransoms. So this is really important here because none of the other BDR solutions out there today have this proactive warning system. Most are going to tell you that they can't um, detect it, but they can only remediate it. But we do both. And then that brings us to the third theme connected with downtime and how we can mitigate it, and that's disaster recovery. So DR offer, uh, it, it's, it's really different. Now, if we look at DR and backup, so the differentiation is we're not just talking about data, right? Now we're also talking about systems. If systems go down, how do we get everyone back up and running quickly? And data backup in DR used to be kind of one and the same. It was all just off-site tape backup. So if that system went down, you have to go get the tape, then rebuild and restore that way. So this solution would take several days at best, really long recovery time. But it was really cheap. And then along came cloud and appliance backup systems. And this was uh, sort of very similar to the idea, but just more modern technology, right? So you'd recover the data, recover the systems, and then you need to rebuild and restore the systems if it went down in order to get the end users back up. Now the recovery time improvement here was from days to about hours. But if you had a need for a even quicker recovery time, you know, if you need to recover in minutes or seconds, then you move to having a second data center. And that data center might be a cold site, a warm site, or a hot site each costing more and more, but of course bringing your recovery time to seconds or minutes instead of hours or days. But the problem here is still the trade-off between downtime and cost. So for each reduction level of downtime, you need to spend more and more and more money. Now if you're a large organization, sure, maybe you have the budget and you can afford that, but if you're a medium enterprise or small to medium business, you just don't have that budget. And the dream has really always been, okay, is there a way to offer disaster recovery to those companies that don't have the budget for it, but they still have the need? And so the answer now is yes, and we can say that with DRAZ. So a solution that can bring the recovery time down, the RTO, down to just mere seconds without having that excessive cost. And really there are two technologies that allow us to do this. One is virtualization and the second is the cloud. And that's those, both of those technologies play into DRAZ. We'll talk about that more here in, in the next couple of slides. So virtualization is going to let us capture physical servers and convert them to virtual machines that can run elsewhere with high performance, industrial strength cloud and especially a cloud that's shared, because if it's shared, then you only have to pay for what you use and when you use it. So this is going to allow the cost to be reduced to much, much less with uh, what we call disaster recovery as a service. 
So let's take a closer look at DRAZ in action, and let's take a, a closer look at some of those factors that play into DRAZ. So taking a look here, we're looking at, at the specific differences between backup and DRAZ. Here's a more detailed way to look at it. So with backup, whether we're talking about tape or disk, you're capturing the data in the systems and then you're storing those backups somewhere off site. And then if an outage occurs, you need to retrieve that tape or hard drive and you need to restore to the original systems. And this all takes time. And then when that's done, finally you'll be back up and running. But this can take hours or days like we were just, just looking at, right? So with DR, along the bottom with disaster recovery, you can see that what we did um, in this detailed look is we reversed the order of the run and restore operations. So yes, we've captured the system images the same as we did before, but now what we can do is directly boot and run that image either locally or in the cloud. So the result here is you can run directly from the backup within minutes or seconds and you can then have the end users back up and running. When the disaster passes, then you can just restore in your own time. So that's a really critical distinction there, and this is a great view of the difference in, in time that it takes with uh, DRAZ, or Disaster Recovery as a Service. So let's take a look at this in action. We know now that DRAZ lets you quickly fail over your systems, and it supports DR to be on demand with push button failover. So here is a scenario. In this situation, we have uh, these end users working on their production systems, and then we'll install the InfraScale disaster recovery solution. So this is a hybrid cloud solution. There we go, got the animation up. So there's an on-premise failover appliance installed locally, and this might be a virtual appliance or a physical appliance, and then a cloud-based service like would run on the Google Cloud, for example. So we'll capture the systems to the appliance, we'll dedupe them and compress uh, the amount of data that's stored, and then we'll replicate those systems up to the cloud. So now we have two copies of those systems, right? One locally on the appliance, and one centrally located on the cloud. So if one system goes down, the administrator could fail over uh, to the local appliance and bring back the most recent point or replica of that system. And then the users continue working with that application or that server. So there's scenario A, right? Now, let's assume that there's a macro disaster or a site-wide outage. So this means the local appliance is no longer available, but that's okay. We'll, we'll still use the same steps here, and we'll fail over instead to the cloud. So just a couple clicks here with the push of a button, and here we'll bring up a full virtual environment that replicates exactly what was on premise, and now the users keep working by interacting directly with those cloud-based systems. So InfraScale offers this with two services. We offer InfraScale Cloud Backup and InfraScale Disaster Recovery. So first with InfraScale Cloud Backup, this is a direct cloud solution. It's completely oriented around data and bare metal image backup, typically for endpoint data protection, so laptops, mobile devices. And this is really optimized for those small to medium businesses and their servers as well as maybe remote and or branch offices and then mid-market companies. Now on the right you see InfraScale Disaster Recovery. This is that hybrid cloud solution that we just saw and it includes an on-premise component as well as the cloud. So of course, yes, you can back up data just like cloud backup, but Disaster Recovery goes further. It captures full system images and then it allows you to boot and run those images on a local appliance or in the cloud. And with that, it's just depending on what you need and depending on the scenario. So like we just saw two separate scenarios. And what we've already done is all of that work behind the scenes in order to prepare those images and just 
really ensure that the images are able to run in the cloud even though they were originally installed and running on a local physical server. So we've done all that work already on, uh, behind the scenes for you. So one more poll here. Now you've heard a little bit more from me. We are going to move into next the InfraScale and Cloud Platform uh, portion of the webinar here, but I want to launch another quick poll. So I'd love to hear again from you. Let's see, just have this launched up now. Great. So which problems are you primarily looking to address with the cloud? A is disaster recovery, B is ransomware mitigation, and C, compliance headaches. So it looks like 33% of you have voted so far. I'll give everyone a few minutes to vote there. And if you'd like to participate, just go ahead and reach forward to select one of those three options. So far, we're mostly spread between A and B. The majority here either answering disaster recovery or ransomware mitigation. And I'd love to hear a little more from you as well. What type of business do you have? Are you a service provider? What industry um, are you currently serving? Um, and that co play, comes into play more for those of you who have compliance issues, whether it be HIPAA compliance, PCI, Safe Harbor, CGIS, um, any of those issues. And we've got about 70% of you have voted so far. I'll give you guys just one more chance to reach forward and participate in this poll. And then I'll go ahead and close this down. And if you wanted to um, comment further, you can go ahead and use the question tool in the software there. So you can um, use that and let me know here what type of business you are whether you're a service provider or maybe a small to medium enterprise, mid-market enterprise, or large enterprise, and what type of industry, and if specific compliance issues um, were, your, were your focus, then I'll definitely be able to um, talk more about what applies to you. So just let me know there in the question tool. And nice, I'll go ahead and close this poll down, and let me share the results. So it looks like 80% of you answered A, disaster recovery, and then 20% answering B, ransomware mitigation. And so that is very much, it looks like the high majority answering um, A, disaster recovery with 80%. Would love to hear a little bit more. Um, so use the question tool and let me know if there are more specific issues and problems that you're looking to address within DR and I'm happy to address those. So just use the question tool for that. Okay, let me go ahead and get back to that screen sharing. So you should now, um, we should be back on the InfraScale and, Cloud and Google Cloud platform page. If you do not see this up on your screen, um, then just use the question tool to type in a comment and let me know. So now I want to highlight that InfraScale's recently announced our partnership with the Google Cloud Platform. So we're combining the InfraScale solutions with the capabilities of the Google Cloud. And it's more than just running our systems on a cloud because the Google Cloud brings some capabilities that are uniquely relevant to backup and disaster recovery. And let's take a look at what those capabilities are now. The first is speed. Now, in a DR scenario, your systems aren't running, right? They're dormant, they're waiting in the case of an emergency. And when that disaster happens, you need to be able to boot and run those systems quickly to minimize downtime. So you need a cloud environment that can boot machines really, really fast. And Google Cloud delivers sub-second data availability. So they're providing high throughput for really prompt restoration of data. And if we take a look at competing systems, those can take four to five hours to do the exact same data archiving tasks. And then on top of that, they're not always consistent. You know, sometimes it takes one hour, sometimes it takes five hours, sometimes it takes three hours. So they're not consistent and they also offer substantially lower throughput 
and plus they're usually charging really expensive fees for restore. So secondly, let's look at scalability. The Google Cloud is scalable. It's built in uh, with load balancers that are part of the worldwide distributed system. They're delivering enterprise class infrastructure to organizations of any size, whether it be large or small. And when you implement a DR solution, you want as much performance as possible. So you need to see those auto scaling capabilities as well in the minute level billing. And when it comes to boot time, the Google Cloud Compute Engine offers faster boot times in the range of 40 to 50 seconds. So that's roughly about a fifth of the time required by competing clouds. And then lastly, let's look at scope. So taking a look at uh, the scope of presence Google's uh, global footprint has over 75 points of presence across more than 33 countries. So this ensures that you receive that same responsiveness that you've come to expect from Google services. So the same systems that support Google Maps, Gmail, and YouTube, right? And lots of organizations these days on top of this have data sovereignty rules. So where the data can and can't reside so if we take a look at these global points of presence, this is sort of an overlay of Google's points of presence and InfraScale's points of presence. Now with Google, we dramatically expand our reach to many more points on the globe, as you can see here. So for those, for those specific data sovereignty rules and issues, take Australia or Canada or England, where the data can't leave the country, it needs to stay local. So we have those local points of presence available. Now, to get a little bit more specific with the integration here between um, InfraScale and the Google Cloud platform, at a very high level here, this is the integration between the two companies and, and the services and solutions. This is best sort of looked at from the bottom up, right? So at the bottom, you have InfraScale Cloud Backup and InfraScale Disaster Recovery. And then the next layer up, we're looking at the source systems that we're trying to protect. So whether it be Windows or Linux or Unix systems, VMware or Hyper-V virtual machines. And then up a layer from there, in either case, there's going to be an agent installed. So either a software agent on the machine or in the case of virtual environments with VMware, it would be a direct connection to their API for data protection. Or in the case of Hyper-V, it would be a host level or hypervisor level agent, so not, on, not every single VM. And then what we're going to capture is capturing those systems, if you look first towards the left, in the case of cloud backup, we'll dedupe the data and directly send it to the cloud of your choosing. And in the case of DR, you can see we capture those systems to an on-premise appliance, deduplicate there, and then replicate the data to the cloud. So you have two copies of that data. And on the far left, you see the central web dashboard. So everything's administered through our centralized dashboard. You can log in from any browser, even on a tablet or a smartphone or laptop. Doesn't require VPN access. Now with all this in mind, let's talk a bit about what we do here at InfraScale. Our mission here is to eradicate downtime and data loss. And with our DRAS offering, you can bring back an entire network in 15 minutes or less guaranteed. And then if we compare with all the big guys out there, which I sort of just alluded to, right, the best IBM, for example, can guarantee you is about two to three hours, but they charge five times as much as we do. So it's a far better service at a much, much better price point. Now, as far as who we are as a company, we were founded in 2011. We cover disaster recovery, cloud backup, endpoint protection, and ransomware protection. And we're doing this, if you take a look at just why, because we believe that every company has the right to protect their valuable data and keep their operations up and running. So we have about 900 partners globally. We're protecting over a million devices worldwide right now, and that number is growing each day. But you don't have to take my word for it. Um, our approach is actually getting lots of attention. 
So leading analyst firm Gartner just uh, recently named us um, in 2015 the cool vendor in business continuity and disaster recovery. And then in 2016, they named us a visionary in the disaster recovery as a service magic quadrant. So if you take a look at the quadrant here, an easy way to really break it down, if you're looking from sort of bottom to top, it's the size of the company, the ability to execute. And then left to right, we're looking at the completeness of vision. So you can see InfraScale's at the very top of that visionary quadrant. And I do have now one more poll for you guys, but I do want to introduce the next steps for you before we get into that poll and also diving into the Q&A. So the next steps for you, I do want to offer you a free trial and a $500 credit so you can test it out for yourself. You don't need to take my word for it or Gartner's word for it, but we're offering any partner who wants to get involved this free trial and $500 credit. Now in order to take advantage of this, because it is only available to you who are participating on this webcast today, so apologies, but if you're listening to the replay video, um, we'll, you'll have to keep your uh, ears and eyes open for uh, the next offer out there. But if you are participating today, you can use the question tool and simply type in $500 credit. And then I'll get you set up with this. We'll get you up and running. So go ahead and you can, I see the, the comments coming through in the questions. I see $500 credit coming through. Go ahead and keep using the question tool to type those comments in. And with that, I do have one last poll for you before we dive into the Q&A. So I'm going to bring this last poll up. There we go. Would you like to learn more about A, InfraScale Disaster Recovery, B, InfraScale Cloud Backup, C, is InfraScale Disaster Recovery and Cloud Backup, and then D, not interested in either solution right now, just here learning. So I'll give everyone a moment to reach forward and participate in this poll. Great, we have about 75% of you have voted so far. We'll give everyone another minute to participate here. Great, we've got 80% of you have voted now. I'll give everyone one more moment. All right, and we have the majority of you guys have voted now. So let me go ahead and take this poll down. And then what we're gonna do is jump into the Q&A. So if you have questions, please make sure to use the question tool there. And I'll go ahead and open up the Q&A portion. Let's see here. All right, so just scrolling to the top of the questions, I see lots of comments coming through and lots of $500 credit requests, which is great. Okay, so for the Q&A, let's see here, I see a couple of questions. Okay, great. So at the top of the Q&A here. All right, the first question says you didn't specify on pricing. Can you let us know how much this costs? So great question. Now uh, the pricing, the pricing model essentially, you you only pay for your usage. Okay, so it's based on um, how much data you have to protect. 
Pricing starts at just a few hundred dollars if you're just using cloud storage. Um, or the, we have those appliances, as you saw, the on-premise appliances can range from anywhere from just uh, one terabyte or a couple of terabytes up to hundreds of terabytes. We have a one U unit up to nine U unit, so it really depends on your needs. But essentially, um, everything is included in that pricing, so no cost associated with, uh, with spinning up a virtual environment in the cloud or on-premise, no, no extra cost for testing, no extra cost for support. We offer 24 by 7 support, 365 days a year, and that's all included in, in the pricing. No professional service fees, um, not in the number of recoveries, it's just the amount of data protected. So with that in mind, I have a question for you. Um, how, many, um, how much data do you have to protect? I'll wait to hear back on that. Um, are there any overage costs? Um, no, there are not. So if you go over capacity, your data is still backed up. We're going to contact you and just let you know that you need more space. And then you're also going to receive warnings as you get close to capacity. So we never leave you hanging without those scheduled backups. Data is always still protected. And then next question says, for VMs, can you only get the most recent or can you go back to checkpoints? So that is a great question. You can go back to any point in time that you have backed up, and you set your backup and retention policies so you have complete control over that. Um, you mentioned data dedupe. What sort of dedupe efficiency do you get? So we do have an up to 90% deduplication rate. It just depends on the types of data and types of files, but we do have that really powerful dedupe technology built right in. And then are there minimum bandwidth requirements? So um, just at least a one megabit connection. Okay, uh, next question says, are you SOX and HIPAA compliant? Yes, we are. We also sign business associate agreements. We do take security very, very seriously. So all of our data centers comply with HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, PCI, Safe Harbor, uh, SSAE 16, CGIS, and many other regulations as well. So the data is encrypted at 256-bit AES locally. It's then sent over an SSL, and then it's encrypted again at 256-bit AES. If you want to take it even a step further, actually, with UltraSafe Max, you not only define the password, but you can also define the encryption key itself as well. So, and regardless of any vendor that you choose, um, if you're subject to any of those regulatory frameworks, make sure that the vendor you choose has that compliance factor built in, right? Okay, uh, next question says, how redundant are your data centers? Um, so, so I did. I did mention we we replicate uh, to another machine within the same data center in in case that cluster goes down. We also replicate to another data center in a different state or geographic region in the event that there's a problem at the data center. And then uh, for those customers who are using our Infrascale disaster recovery solution um, that we that we looked at that we saw today, you do have two copies there as well, locally and in the cloud. Okay, is there a question to allow high priority backups versus lesser valued data if space is limited? So yes, um, we do have those priority settings. You set the priority based on the age and value of your data. So you have access to um, completely customize that. Okay, uh, my problem is that the computer itself was stolen. I had a Windows image backup but I can't restore it to a new computer. Can you do that? So yes, we can. That's bare metal recovery to dissimilar hardware. We do support that. Okay, let's see. Does the, does, how does the MSI work for mass deployment? So our MSI builder sort of solves the problem with deployment for installation across all devices, right? So we built a flexible and intelligent MSI wizard for mass deployment. Um, the wizard has an Active Directory integration and it runs silently, so it's completely transparent to the end user. So when you're building um, your MSI, you can define what to back up and when, 
You can also set a date for it to expire, so you essentially set the amount of time that you're allowing for your deployment. Then the next time any of your users log into their computer, the InfraScale MFI is going to detect that user's logged in. It will then verify with the cloud that the user exists, and if it does, just automatically start backing it up. If not, then it will create the account on the fly, set up all the backups, apply all the policies assigned, and then it will start backing up. Okay, let's see. Next question says, is this compatible with my WAN accelerators? Steelhead. So when you look at WAN acceleration and over-the-wire deduplication, just make sure that the replication speeds incredibly fast. We use both of these technologies with data compression built into our solutions. So while some solutions require that you buy a WAN acceleration system, we've already built that right in. And we have that patented dedupe technology as well, so we can dramatically reduce the data payload that gets pushed over the wire. Okay, um, are your data centers high availability? And how is this different from HA and VMware? So HA is different from DR. Um, with HA, it's generally concerned with real-time replication. But then, so if you, if you mess up your production copy, you synchronize that to your replicated copy. So our solution is far less expensive than HA as well. Um, and we talked about that just a little bit when on the slide that we talked about uh, sort of the cold site, warm site, and hot site uh, DR. Okay, do, does your solution integrate with RMMs and PSAs like ConnectWise or Kaseya? Yes, we do. Okay, how do I get data back on site from the cloud? Okay, this is a great question. So it's important to note that we move compute resources to where the data sits. So if you have 500 terabytes of data sitting on the appliance or 500 terabytes sitting in the cloud, we're going to move the VMs and run the VMs where the data is. So this is really the brilliance of DRAS, right? It's removing the bandwidth bottleneck from a hybrid cloud solution where if you have a lot of data in a small pipe, you're going to have problems getting that data back down. But using DRAS, we don't require you to move your data back to compute, but we're moving compute to where your data is. So we can boot you up in, in, in seconds or minutes, no matter how much data you have. Okay, let's see, do you offer monthly payments? Um, we do, we offer flexible payment options. We also have monthly payment plans available. Um, so you can start today, you can start anytime. We do offer hardware as a service. Instead of paying all of it up front, you can pay on a monthly installment basis, and we have that for our 1200 and 1500 series. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions here. Let's see. With Cloud Boot, can I fail over to the cloud myself? Or do I have to create a ticket and then and then you'll spin up a VM manually? Okay, um, good question here. So so you can fail over yourself with just a couple clicks uh, of a button. So the push button failover really is um, so easy that you know a fourth grader could do it. Just a couple of clicks through this through the dashboard, and then you're you're all set and good to go with the cloud boot. Um, and for, for more specifics on that, I'll, I'll get you set up with a live demo. Um, just sort of a 15-minute demo will get, get you actually within the software and see it uh, firsthand for yourself. Okay, do you support having multiple versions of backups? Yes, we do. We support versioning. And just a couple more questions as well. Okay, just scrolling through here. Let's see. Do you give training or onboarding for me or my customers? Um, so, yes, we do. We have a U.S.-based customer success team. Um, half, of, half of us located here in Los Angeles, the other half in Salt Lake City. 
and we'll provide onboarding and we also have our partner resource center which we call our PRC which provides you templates, videos, data sheets, lots of other resources for you to get started there as well. Looks like follow-up question to that. Do you, um, do you have anything to help me with marketing or lead gen in my area? Uh, so we do, yes. We offer uh, co-marketing events and uh, lead gen events. We also offer uh, virtual events and MDF. So we do offer market development funds to our partners as well. And I'm happy to talk more, I'm happy to talk with you about that a little bit further. So I'll reach out to you after the presentation. And, um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, guys.